eight days. What started before creation and was whispered throughout every day that followed. Thousands of years of prophecy and centuries of silence all led to the birth of a king. For 33 years, he walked and talked and prayed and healed and showed us a perfect life of love. Willingly stepping into the greatest sacrifice of all. To bring us into a defining moment that would forever restore humanity. One single breath changed everything. A heartbeat that had not been beating, but beat again, changed everything. Well, happy Easter, everyone. If I haven't met you before, my name is Grant, the teaching pastor here at Christ the King, and I'm so glad to be sharing Easter with you, and I want to welcome a whole bunch of people that are on the other side of that camera right now. We've got friends watching from Arizona, Manitoba, California, Ken Kenya, Tanzania, and Ghana right now. Can we welcome our brothers and sisters from all over the place? I'm glad you're here. So last week I was up at Regent College prepping for this particular message and as I pulled into the parking lot I saw a young college student who was walking quickly with their head down focused intently on their phone while being on a collision course with a metal pole. Before I could say anything or do anything the pole was completely victorious. The phone, a backpack, an armful of books, and a person hit the ground simultaneously. Their head bounced off of the concrete, and my godly response was, oh, that's going to leave a mark. <laughs> Apparently, my mercy scale was not very high at that particular moment. People began to move towards the student, but in a true display of human tenacity, he got up, gathered his things, rubbed his head, checked for blood, assured everyone he was going to be just fine, and kept on walking, looking at his phone. You know, I don't know if that young man has a scar, but he certainly could have. And he probably should have. We all have scars that when noticed become stories of resiliency and ultimately healing. For many Easter's in a row here at Christ the King, we've shared stories of people who brought their past scars to Jesus and we celebrated how God forgave their sin, transformed their lives, restored their broken dreams and gave their scars meaning. This year, the story is not on the screens. It's actually sitting in the room with you right now. This Easter, I'm gonna celebrate the fact that scars are a sign of healing. Scars are trophies of survival, that the marks we bear on our souls are a continual testimony to God's healing work in our lives. This Easter, I'm celebrating my friend and my brother, Monty Mayberry. Monty has a fresh scar that runs down the center of his chest that he earned after receiving a heart transplant. Monty's in our small group. We've been praying with him for years for God to give him a new heart, and this year, he got one. Monty's life is a testimony to God's grace because all the time he was waiting for a new heart, he was running a nonprofit and helping place people in recovery and in treatment centers. You see, Monty has some old scars from an old life that he now uses as a platform in a story. And the story is this. No matter how far away from God you think you are, God will never give up on you, ever. I love you, Monty. My friend Don Silva's had scars. A lifetime of health issues never stopped Don from loving his family and his friends thoroughly and completely. Don had so many surgeries, they actually removed a portion of his sternum for easier access. True story. I prayed with Don so many times, thinking he was going to go home to be with Jesus. It became a running joke between the two of us. He would see me at church and smile and wave and say, I'm still here. Don went home to be with Jesus about a week ago. And his scars were exchanged for a crown and a well done, good and faithful servant. I look around this room today and into that camera and I see a symphony of scars. My mom and dad are both cancer survivors and they have the scars to prove it. Happy Easter, mom and dad in Manitoba. 
My brother and friend Carl Nielsen is here today. Carl was crushed in a horrific car accident that shattered one side of his body, but he's here today praising God and using his life to talk to people about Jesus. And if you know Carl, he'll talk about Jesus every chance he gets. Our dear friend Lisa will be here later on today. She has a scar from an aortic aneurysm and a story about the healing power of Jesus. She is a walking miracle. My friends carry physical scars, one that can be seen, but as I look around this room, I see more survivors. I see the emotional scars of friends that are in this faith family who are still standing. And the fact that you're still standing is a testimony to God's grace because you have faced desperate disappointment, traumatic miscarriages, unrelenting grief, betrayal, depression, and heartbreaking loss, and you're still standing and we celebrate the fact that you are still here. I believe that John Steinbeck was right when he said this, to be alive at all is to have scars. We celebrate those with scars around here because every scar is a story of hope. The story of Jesus is a story of beauty in scars. We've been doing a series called Eight Days. We've been walking with Jesus through the eight days leading up to this day. And in every single one of the days, we've watched as he accumulated marks on his soul before the brutal scars of the crucifixion. Holy Palm Sunday left a mark of hypocrisy as the same people who shouted, God save us, just a few days later were shouting, crucify him. Holy Monday left the mark of disappointment as Jesus confronted what was supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of mercy, and a house of help, but had been transformed into a den of thieves. People intent on greed. Holy Tuesday left the mark of empty religion as Jesus acknowledged just how fake and fraudulent his people can sometimes be. Holy Wednesday left the mark of betrayal as one of his closest friends betrayed him for cash. Holy Thursday left the mark of agony as Jesus embraced the weight of our sin, knowing the cross was coming, and Good Friday left literal marks. Jesus was beaten, broken, and scourged beyond the point of human recognition, Scripture says, so that he could pay a price for our sin, a debt that we can't repay. Saturday left the mark of silence. On Saturday, it appeared that death and the devil had won... <laughs> But then came Sunday. On Sunday, the marks, the wounds, and the pain were transformed into healing and power and life. The ladies who went to the grave, they thought they were going to be intermingling with death. They thought they were preparing the body of Jesus, which was lifeless. They thought they were preparing him for a tomb, and instead of finding death, something else happened. The Bible says after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. It was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay and then quickly go and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Now I have told you what? Jesus was dead, but now he's alive. I graduated from college with a Near Eastern ancient history major. I would love to spend this entire time dialoguing out for you the irrefutable evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. He was seen by his disciples and over 500 witnesses. He came to his people. He ate, he talked, he healed, he encouraged, and I'm sure mystified and shocked every person who witnessed his resurrection. I could spend hours laying out the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus and the legal testimony of martyrs who refused to recant the truth to the point of death that Jesus was alive. But I'm going to tell you, one of the greatest the greatest proofs of the resurrection existing right now is sitting in front of me. It's the presence of God's people over the centuries who continue to do the ministry of Jesus. Some around the world who face death and persecution every day. And you got to ask yourself the question, why do people keep gathering? Why do people, people keep serving? One reason. We know our Redeemer lives. 
Let's talk about a moment when Jesus showed up after his resurrection. John chapter 20 says this. Now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Well, the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Tom, put your finger here. See my hands? Go ahead, Re reach out your hand, put it in my side. Stop doubting in belief. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I love Thomas because <laughs> I can relate to the skeptic in him. He needed proof of the resurrection because of what he had seen just a few days earlier with his own eyes. Thomas saw him dead. He just wanted proof. Thomas is not alone in being doubtful. He was just being courageous enough to voice the questions that were rolling through everybody else's mind. He just wanted someone to show him. Just show me the evidence of the miracle and I will believe. Just so you know, this room is filled with people who cried out to God from a place of deep wounding and pain and for every single one of them, God responded and showed up in a variety of miraculous ways. And I know some people are doubting and thinking, but Grant, I cried out and he never showed up for me. I'm still waiting. And I'm glad you're here because I would like to ask you to consider something. What if Jesus is showing up and answering your cry right this second. This part of the resurrection story touches me in the depth of my soul for one reason. Jesus showed up with his scars. When I first saw that reality in the story, I was confused. Why in the world would you want to hold on to your scars? I mean, if you were completely resurrected, wouldn't you want the body you died in to be completely made whole? Why in the world would Jesus leave his scar, not leave his scars in the grave? I believe there are three reasons. I'm sure there's more. Why Jesus kept his scars. Number one. The scars of Jesus tell a story of understanding. Hebrews 2.17 says, For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. I have scars. So do you. And Jesus understands the pain behind all of them. The Bible tells us Jesus understands betrayal, isolation, grief, temptation, pressure, and despair. Jesus carries the marks of every human tragedy so that you and I can know there's one in heaven whose heart breaks over every tear that you've ever shed. You thought no one noticed your tears. Jesus does. And my prayer is that on this Easter Sunday morning, you'll open your heart today to a Jesus who so desperately wants to be your light in the darkest moments of your existence. Scars of Jesus tell a story of understanding. Secondly, they tell a story of love. Romans 5, 6 says, you see, at just the right time. Oh, let's back up for just a second. Do you know who wrote Romans the greatest missionary in the world who was a hitman before he became a follower of Jesus. He killed Christians for sport. And then he was transformed and through the Holy Spirit wrote these words. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Well, I was still being an idiot, <laughs> doing my own thing, rejecting God and choosing my own way. Jesus was dying for me. While we were still marking ourselves with bad decisions, false gods, counterfeit belief systems, arrogant statements, like, like I'm the master of my own destiny. While we were still doing that, while we were walking a path away from God, Jesus did this, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The scars on the hands, feet, and side of Jesus, they all tell a story of love. Listen to Luke chapter 24. This is the testimony of a medical doctor who took copious notes about the eyewitness accounts of the disciples. He wrote this, while the disciples were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. I laugh every time I hear that. Do you think you'd experience peace if somebody who was dead suddenly showed up in front of you in the middle of your living room? <laughs> hey guys, take a deep breath, it's okay. <laughs> peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still didn't believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, anybody got anything to eat around here? <laughs> you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Okay, I would have chosen steak, but there you go, okay? And he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. It is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. A love story told through the scars of Jesus. And here's one more reason why Jesus kept his scars. To tell a story of understanding, to tell a story of love, and finally to tell a story of victory. All through scripture, Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. That's what Shana and Eve were so beautifully singing about before. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said this, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John knew that Jesus was going to lay his life down as a perfect sacrifice so that you and I could have a relationship and be reconciled to God. And at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book, it says something about Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Bible says, then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, here it comes, looking as if it had been slain looking as if it had been slain with wounds and scars, standing at the center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. Did you see that? A lamb looking as if it had been slain, carrying the marks of everything Jesus had been through, looking as if it had been slain, but then what? Standing. Standing in victory, not laying down in death, no, standing as the risen Savior, covered with scars that shout to me right now and to you right now, Jesus did it all for you. Jesus is saying that right now. He's right here. You may not be able to see them. I pray that, I can, that you can sense them. The entire Trinity showed up for church this morning. It's a beautiful, glorious thing. And Jesus is saying to all of his children, to each of us, I did all of this for you. So when I came to Jesus, I was marked with my own sin. I had walked my own direction, done my own thing. I was covered in wounds 
that I made myself. And in the years I've had walking with Jesus, he has healed and redefined every single scar. And I can tell you, he still has a lot of work to do on me. <laughs> but his track record's outstanding. And he just keeps working away and working away. Every day that I walk with him, I continue to discover some amazing facts. He actually loves me. Not just all the good things, but everything about me. He speaks truth when I need to hear it. He calms my fears when I'm feeling them. He gives purpose to my pain. And he brings light into my darkest moments. I'm an eyewitness because I have personally experienced this reality. Jesus can heal your past and give you hope for the future. I so want that for you. I've lived parts of my life without Jesus. I now live all of my life with Jesus and I will never go back. This was so empty. The wounds didn't make sense. The scars were always bleeding. But when Jesus steps in and begins to heal the memories and the pain, everything changes. Right now, this morning, Jesus wants to heal the scar of sin that runs across every single heart in this room. Jesus paid the price for all of my sin and your sin. And scripture says, by his wounds, we are healed. Physical scars are a sign of the body's ability to heal. Well, I want you to know something. Jesus wants to do the same kind of work in the deepest part of your soul. Jesus wants to heal the wounds we can see and the ones that we can't. So I have a question for you today. On this Easter Sunday morning, will you accept the salvation that Jesus offers you? Would you give your life to the one who gave his life for you? Will you open your heart today and say, God, I'm sick and tired of carrying all of these wounds. I want to be healed. I'll tell you what, it's okay to have doubts. Thomas was one of the 12, and he had a hard time believing this. And he got to see Jesus with his own eyes. But do you remember what Jesus said to Thomas, his disciple? Blessed are those who see and believe, but even more blessed are those who believe but can't see. Here's what I know about the human condition, and it's because I experience it every single day. Most of us can only see the wounds of our own failures. We focus on them. We fixate on every bad decision we've ever made. We focus on our own broken lives. And then we buy a lie. We think all God can see is our broken past, our empty promises, and our bad decisions. That's not true. God sees so much more of you don't believe the lie that all God sees in you is your failures. Instead, believe this because it's true. Satan wants to define you by your scars. Jesus wants to define you by his. Today, you can allow the scars of Jesus to be your salvation story and I want to give you an opportunity to do exactly that if you want all that God offers to you if today you want to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord I want to invite you into this moment this room is filled with people that would testify this is the most important decision you can ever make in your life 
to lay down your heart and your wounds and your scars and your future and to say, Jesus, I receive everything you have for me. I want to be in heaven someday singing holy to you. Today, if you'd like to lay down your scars at the feet of Jesus and receive all the love that his scars embody, you can. Right now. So we're going to pray together. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. The only reason we do that is so we can focus, okay? It's easy to be distracted in our world. But today, if you want the wounds to be healed, in the powerful name of Jesus, if you want to give your life fully and completely to him, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me right now in the depth of your soul. It's okay to have doubts. Just believe. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you are the Son of God and that you came to earth to die for my sin. I believe right now that you were scarred so I could be healed. God, I believe you were raised to life and that you defeated death in the grave once and for all. Right now, I believe in your victory over death and my sin. God, I ask you to forgive my sin make me whole I'm asking right now God would you give my scars meaning Lord I'm asking you right now to be the Lord and the leader of my life God I want to give my life to you because you gave your life for me God lead me and use me to point more people towards you. I ask for your healing right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed on this Easter, if you prayed that prayer, once again, you made the most important decision of your life. Surrendering to Jesus takes courage. But it's the beginning of the most incredible journey. And I would love to pray for you if you prayed that prayer this morning. I mean, if you prayed that, God, heal my wounds, heal my heart, save me right now. If you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up in the air? Just put it straight up. God bless you. God bless you and you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in the back. God bless you in this section. God bless you. God bless you over here on my right. God bless you both right here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you both over there in the corner. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for saving me. After all the times I rejected you. Thank you for never giving up and thank you for never giving up on my brothers and sisters who just made a courageous stand for Jesus. God, I pray in this moment you would help them now to take a step of faith. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 9.30, would you stand with me for just a moment? So can I just talk to you from the bottom of my heart? When I raised my hand years ago at Faith Fellowship Baptist Church in Brandon, Manitoba, my pastor, Bob Dunlop, freaked me out. 
He said, this takes courage, but would you take a step of faith? And he stood at the front of the church and he said, if you raised your hand, I want you to come down to the front because I want to be the first person to welcome you to the family of God. And I remember I was like, I will never regret stepping out for Jesus because Jesus stepped out for me. So we we don't do bait and switch around here. We don't fool people. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. If you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to step out of your seat and come to the front. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come right down here. I'm going to get off this platform. I don't like platforms anyway. And I'm going to stand here and I'd love to be the first person to shake your hand and welcome you to the family of God. And then you're going to go that direction to that exit sign. There's a bunch of people over here, Pastor Brian and his team. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take 15 minutes of your Easter. We'd like to get to know your story. Your name actually matters to us. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you. We want to give you a Bible. That's it. This is my promise. No one will do anything weird. We promise we won't. Can I tell you something about this church family? It's a little messy. We can be pretty messed up. But we have a Savior who changes everything. So if you raise raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to be courageous. If you have a child who raised their hand, you can come with them. If If you came here with somebody, they can come with you. But we really want to connect with you. So I'm going to come stand right down here. And if you raised your hand... Would you meet me right down here, right now? Come right this direction. Just start stepping out and keep coming.